Well, welcome to Maranatha Baptist Church and our Sunday school lesson. Uh, we're starting a new series this morning. Uh, so hopefully you'll like this lesson, this series. I enjoy this series. Looking forward to teaching this one. And so well, if we can uh, come all together, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Anybody got any prayer requests? And we'll go ahead and see if we can try to do that. And I'll try to repeat as long as you're loud enough so I can hear. I can repeat your prayer requests. Somebody have prayer requests they want me to. Anybody? Sister Carol. Your cousin, Ravi Pruitt, has COVID and pneumonia in a, in a hospital. Okay, pray for her cousin, Ravi Pruitt. Any, yes, pray for Lynn Conyers. I think she's having a procedure done this morning, I, I think. Tomorrow? Okay, so it's tomorrow. Okay, so pray for Lynn Conyers, of course. Anybody else? Of course, pray for Preacher Coffee and his wife, Pat, to recover from COVID as well. Anybody else? Okay. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Go, and go to prayer to our Lord and talk to him about these things. Dear Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your grace your mercy, your kindness, your goodness in our lives each and every day. Um, please forgive us where we fail you, where we sin in our hearts and lives, and um, help us, Lord, how to live for you. I know that's what you want us to do, but help us, Lord, to, to where we fail, Lord, help us how to live for you like we should, and to, to grow in the grace and knowledge of you, Lord. Help in these requests, Lord. Help uh, Carolyn Rhodes' cousin. Uh, help him, Lord, to to recover from this pneumonia and for uh, COVID, Lord, help him. And I think uh, maybe Elle Austin had somebody, too, that she had mentioned has COVID as well. Help Preacher Coffee and Pat to recover from the COVID as well. And others, Lord, who are dealing with things right now. Dear Father, we ask you to help uh, Lynn Conyers take care of her and uh, the upcoming procedure she's having to have, I think, tomorrow. Uh, Lord, you know all about that. Just help her, Lord, through all of that, if you would, please. And Lord, help us this morning how to learn from your word, to, to help us, Lord, to learn to, how to draw closer to you and to see the things that you've done to, to help in, in the past and always, how you're always there to help out. And, and Lord, just guide and direct our steps, Lord, this morning, that you'd be honored, that you'd be glorified. Help pastor the strength and the grace and the wisdom he needs this morning as he preaches. And Lord, help with the teen ministry, the children's ministry, the Sunday school classes all the ministries this morning, that you would be honored and glorified. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So as you see, this new lesson is called Bondage, Freedom from Bondage. Uh, experience the deliverance of God uh, gives his people. So it's about Exodus. I told you earlier, I told you weeks ago to read Exodus. Start reading Exodus. It doesn't cover the entire book of Exodus. It does the first few lessons cover the first part of Exodus, and then it jumps all the way towards the end in Exodus there. But uh, hopefully you find it interesting. Uh, I do. I love Old Testament anyway, studying the Old Testament. So people don't want to deal with the Old Testament, but it's there for a reason. I'll show you something why. In 1 Corinthians, as for an admonition, as you see here, and it says 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 11 says, Now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. So they're there for a purpose, upon whom the ends of the world are come. If you would, turn to, I know this is not, this is a different introduction, because I know you're looking at your booklet and say, well, this is not in my introduction. I expanded your introduction. So this lesson's going to be introduction and part one of lesson one. That's what it's going to work out today. So, so if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses, we'll turn there, in verse 1 through 12, we're going to read that. So you can get the gist of this. When Paul wrote this, moreover, brethren, I would not have, would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, keep in mind, who, what is he referring to here? Anybody have any ideas? Paul's writing this, and this whole passage here is going to deal with what? Coming out of Egypt, right, and how the Lord led them out of Egypt. He's dealing with that again right here in 1 Corinthians. Paul is addressing that. So he says here in verse 2, And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud in the sea, and did all eat the spiritual meat, 
and did all drink the spiritual drink. For they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye. Now he goes through this and talks about the Israelites. When they came out of Egypt, he's talking about them. He was what? He was not pleased with all of them because of these things. Now these things were, or verse uh, 7. Neither be ye idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now think of those things he just listed there about these people, and how he was displeased with them, how they behaved. I know this jumps through Exodus and jumps way into further in, to the history of Israel, but he's over, giving you an overview about this, about the Israelites. And he goes into verse 11. <clears throat> now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. He is talking about the Israelites. Who, are, who, are, where, who were they? Who were the Israelites? His people. Now, today, we, those who have accepted Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we belong to the Lord, do we not? As a church, we belong to him. If we accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. Here are his own people that he chose, he selected. I'll talk about that in the moment. I'll show you this here in a minute. He selected those people, and yet they still displease him. Do we displease him too? Yes, we do. And Paul's trying to warn the church, don't you be like that. That's an example of what happened to those people. So keep that in mind. So let's, let's go on. This is a quote from a book here. I can't say it any better than this. I thought it was better to show it this way. In a very real sense, the history revealed in the Old Testament is the history of a special people. These people from earliest times, known as the Hebrews and progressively as Israelites and Jews, constitute the human theme of the book. The reason for, the need for, the reason for a need for a special people through whom God could reveal his re redemptive purpose of all the world is fairly obvious. In the final analysis, all that can be said is that God loved them, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, and made them a special object of his grace. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, it says, and I'm going to read seven, ver chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, the Lord did not set, and this is, when Deuteronomy was written, they had gone through the Exodus, they had gone through the wilderness and Moses writes them in Deuteronomy, he says this, The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out, and with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. This was written for our examples, how God loved these people, the Israelites. He chose them, his special people, to choose them for what purpose? What did I say there? In that, what's that one line says? I don't know how well you can read it. To reveal his redemptive purpose. He used a nation to do that. Because it's through Israel. You think about it, through Israel, the world's history revolves around that, really. Everything that happened to the Israelites, the world's history has revolved around that. One way or another, what's happened. The Pentateuch. The Pentateuch means the five books. And that's a Greek, comes from a Greek word. I'm not going to Greek and all that. I had to look this up myself. But the Pentateuch comes from a Greek phrase meaning five books. The Hebrew call it the Torah. So we use it as the Pentateuch. But Exodus is the second book of the Pentateuch. So you should be familiar with that. Here I wanted you to see kind of the, the Pentateuch in relationship to history and how it fits over history overall. So what you got here, and I, I'm just, I guess this is my downfall because I like to see things in a chronological order. I like to visualize it. I understand it better. I pick up on it better that way. I'm a very visual person. So I illustrate this to show you how Genesis, and of course, you're going to look, the, the earth started in 4000 B.C. 
Well, I don't know if it started 4,001, 4,005, 4,020, but somewhere in that range, it started back then. It's not millions and billions of years old. We know that because God created the world. God created everything. So approximately this time, about 4,000 B.C., it covers from that period, as you see, to about 1876. Oh, John, you're going down to 1876, an exact year? It's all approximate. Everything has to just work out approximately here for you, okay? So it's approximately over 2,300 years Genesis covers all that period of time from creation all the way down through Joseph and to Jacob, and them, okay? Then you got the Exodus, which is approximately 430 years in time. Then you got Leviticus, which only a month. One month there is covering there. Then you got Numbers, which is over 38 years. You know, the wilderness journey and all that is dealing with the book of Numbers. And then you got Deuteronomy, which is the last, after their wilderness journey, Moses writes this last book to them before he passes away is in Deuteronomy. But I want you to see about this, this little bit of relationships. You understand these books together. If you have any questions about anything, just let me know and we'll stop. All right, you probably could draw this next one for me. You've seen us enough times, you probably could sketch it out on your own every time. How well can you see it? I hope you can see it well. I was hoping this is as good as it gets, I guess. But as you see there, there's the, uh, I'm going to point towards it up here, and I know it's just differently. Here's when the creation of the world. You've got Jacob, you've got Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, uh, Moses. I mean, yeah, Moses right there. And Joshua and on, and goes on. Here you got the kings where they started the monarchy. You got King Saul and David and keeps on going. They got divided kingdom, the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom, how they go in captivity, and of course, uh, Calvary over here. So here is Exodus, about 1446. Some say 1446, 1445. I mean, we don't know. We're just doing it as close as we can. What's significant about Exodus is the temple. In 2 Kings. Uh, 6 verses 1 through 38 talks about the establishing of the, of the temple by Solomon and how many years it was after the Exodus, after they had left Egypt, Exodus, uh, after they left Egypt, I'm sorry. It's significant there. So we're going to zoom in a little bit here on this section here. I'm zooming into the next screen. So here's the next screen. The next screen is a little bit more busier, and you've seen this before. I know this is a history lesson for you. But I want you to see in relationship about this whole thing about the book of Exodus, how it fits all together here for you. Here, you'll see at the, uh, I just wish it was darker for you. Here's Joseph, here, you know, here's about what that year it is. He, when he, remember he was, how did Joseph get into Egypt? Took a camel there, how did he get there? How did Joseph get into Egypt? I'm sorry? He was sold into slavery, wasn't he? He was put into slavery by his brothers. Remember that? So he goes into Egypt. And then while he's in there, we talked about the life of Joseph. We dealt with that before. So you've seen some of these things. While he was in there, he became what? He didn't stay a slave, did he? Pardon? A second in command, did he not, while he was there? How the Lord blessed him. And while he was there, he asked his parent, his, his, well, his father, his mother's gone. But he asked his mother and his brothers and all them to come to Egypt with him. And they did, did they not? So that's significant here. Oh, right there, that time, about that time there where, when Jacob and all those leave, they leave Canaan and they come into Egypt. It's the starting of this period of time for them, for being in Egypt. So from here, they're, and while they're there, what's happened? Anybody remember why they were in Egypt? When Jacob came into Egypt, what happened? Well, there was a famine, yes. But what happened to the, the Israelites while they were there? What did jo maybe I'm not expressing the right words. What did Joseph and Pharaoh was put a stamp of approval on it for the Israelites? It's got the best place in the land. Gave them the best part of the land to live in and to raise their sheep because and cattle and all that. Because Joseph told told his family, tell them that you're shepherds. And they don't like shepherds anyways. But what happened? Pharaoh says, you can have the best land over here. Gave them the best land. Isn't that amazing? How the Lord just provides for them. He didn't put them out there and stick them out in the desert somewhere. Y'all just suffer through and make it through this. How this Pharaoh here, uh, acceptingly, 
like Joseph, had him in second command, had his family come in and said, hey, here, you can have the best place in the land right now. And what were they experiencing? Like you said, they were experiencing famine, were they not? But they were given the best land there. How the Lord just worked and blessed and took care of his people in all of this. Over here to the far side, we'll pick up on this side right here. Here's where we're going to zoom in on the next screen for you. because that's Now here's the, the key part I want to deal with. Here's where Joseph, he dies. He's about 110. It says Joseph dies in Egypt. Now if you turn to Exodus, you would please. Exodus chapter 1. We'll be back and forth over this, but Exodus chapter 1, and it says, Now these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt. Every man and his household came with, with Jacob. Now remember, because Joseph's already there, now Jacob comes and all the others come with him. And he says, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulon, Benjamin, Dan, and Nephtali, and Gad, and Asher, and all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and that generation, and the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceeding mighty, and the land was filled with them. The next verse comes in. Where it says, now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. But I want you to see in relationship, and how, hopefully you can see this in timeline here. Because that's how I visualize these things. The time of Joseph's death, about this time, is about 75 years later when a new king comes into place. Approximately 75 years, even after Joseph has died. And what did it say there? Joseph died and who else died? Who else died in that time period? What did it say right there in Exodus? I know I ask questions. I know it's a Sunday morning and I ask questions. Yeah, but what else, who else died in there? All the brothers of that generation died. All, those, all of them died off in that time period. Reuben, Simeon, Zebulon, Dan, all them guys passed away. It says the whole generation passed away in that time span. So they're all gone. So now here's the descendants of all of them at this time. But internet, 75, approximately 75 years, they still lived in peace. But it says here in Exodus chapter, well, let me, we'll pick up on this again. Let me stop right there. Here's my question to you. Why did the Lord bring them into, into Egypt and allow them to become slaves. Did not the Lord already know this? Of course he did. Pardon? Of course he did. He That's right. He knew it. And he already said it was going to happen to them. The Lord already told Abraham this was going to happen. That they were going to go into a land that's not their own. And they were going to serve a people as well while they're there. So think about why, why is this taking place? I know it. Don't, don't question God. I understand. I'm not questioning the Lord why he does things. I just, I like to understand a little bit more sometimes. I probably won't, it's not going to have the complete answer here for you. But just want to share something to think about, about this. Because the Lord, he brought them into Egypt, did he not? He had them come into Egypt. I mean, worked it all out. There was a famine. They had to go somewhere. So they went into Egypt. That's where they went to. He knew all this. He laid, this, is, this is God's plan all the way along. Nothing caught God off guard with any of this that took place. This was his plan. So in our own lives, when things take place, if we're trusting the Lord, Lord, whatever, we don't, may not know what the plan is, but when things take place, we just trust him when things take place. Because he's in control. So here's some points I got from a book and I thought and I added some other things to it as well. But one of them was to prepare Israel for their inheritance. When they were in Canaan, how many were in there? When they lived in Canaan in, in Jacob's time, how many about were there? You already heard about it. Seventy souls, wasn't it? That's, that's not very many to take over a, a territory, a land, a, a mass that was promised to them. And I'll show you the promise here in a minute because we're going to talk here in, in Genesis chapter 15 about the promise that was given to them. 
So in that time period that they're in Egypt, for over 400 years, what's happening? They're multiplying. They're increasing. And what does it say there in verse 7? And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. They were growing. They were having children. They were growing. And the Lord was blessing them with children to multiply why they were there. So the time you get to the point of the Exodus, there's probably approximately 2 million of them leaving Egypt. Versus 70 who entered, you've got 2 million that are leaving now at this time. How the Lord blessed them in all this. Another point to, th to think of. Here's the key one here for you. God promised to Abraham that his descendants would and I'll give you the points here, but turn to Genesis if you want to see it. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. Genesis 15. Get myself over there. 15. Well, I'll pick up in verse 12. But, and when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him. In verse 13, And he said unto Abram, that's, that's the Lord talking to Abram, Now know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will, will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark, behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. Here was the, here was the promise to Abraham. And what did this promise involve here? They would be a stranger, a land that is not theirs. That was in Egypt. They shall serve them and shall, and they, the Egyptians, shall afflict them 400 years. Those people that they, they were living with were going to afflict them, and they did. Did they not? They shall come out with what? Great substance. Now, isn't it, doesn't it sound, they're going to be slaves, but when they leave, they're going to have all this stuff when they leave. All this substance. It doesn't, in our minds, we think, that, that doesn't that's hard to understand sometimes. But the Lord said, this is going to happen. And this is what's going to happen and how it's going to happen. And they're still going to get blessed, even though they became slaves. Isn't it amazing how God does things for us? He, how he did this for Israelites. He did this for them. He said, they're just going to be slaves and they're just going to have to get out of Egypt the best they can. That's not how it worked, did it? God brought them out of Egypt. And when he brought them out, the Egyptians were like, here, take what you need. Take everything. And we'll see this later on when we get to, to the Exodus part. But they take a great substance out of Egypt as well. Another point here, and have the land in Canaan and its surrounding areas. Because where Abraham was at was in Canaan. Remember? When God gave him this promise, he was there. And while he's there, he's given this promise that your people are going to have all this land. And he explains what that land is. If you look in verse 18, go down a little bit further. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land. From the river you, Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Kadamites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphidim and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Now, what did the Lord just list there? All these people that were now living in that area where, where Abram was at. These people who, who, who had all these lands all the way around Canaan, all this area that he, he identified here. You know what? God says, you're going to have all this land. Your descendants are going to have all of this. Now, when he talked to Abraham, there's not that many of them. Just Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob. But out of Jacob came a tribe, came 12 tribes, 12, 12 guys who became tribe, heads of tribes, did they not? And that flourished. But here with Abraham, it's only him and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob taking place. Well, around that time period. But he said, what? You're going to have all of this. It's going to be your descendants. But it's going to take a while before you get this piece of property here. Isn't it amazing how God blesses and how he laid this all out before them? Last point here.
God had patience with the Amorites. If you saw that in the last verse down there, verse, uh, was it verse 16. But in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now, who were the Amorites? That's right. The Amorites was, is, is, was one of the largest groups of people. When you say Canaanites, they use it sim simultaneously with the Canaanites. Those people that live there. But you know what he said about them? Their iniquity is not yet full. You think about God's patience with those people. Those people who were in all kinds of iniquity that they were into. And they went on year and year in, year out, constantly. How gracious God was with those people. Yet they still would not turn from their wicked ways at all. And he said their iniquities were not full. Almost 400 years, over 400 years later, when their iniquity gets to that point, because that's when the Israelites come into, come into uh, well, over 400 some years, after they went through the wilderness, how they come into Canaan and they wipe them out. But how God's gracious still in so many ways. Gracious to his people, Israelite, his, his own people, but gracious to an unsaved people, giving them time, but they still would not repent either. I just think that's amazing. I don't know if you do, but I think it's amazing how God's been very gracious. So into the lesson. Lesson one. That's your big introduction. Hopefully you got the big introduction. You got the big picture of what's going on. You'll see that one slide again here in a moment. We'll come back to that in a minute. The last slide I showed you there. So delivered by the grace of God. That's what this lesson deals with. And I already said earlier, we're just going to do with the first part of this whole lesson. A hateful culture. There it is. It looks, looks kind of dark, don't it? I mean, just when you look at it, it's dark, it's red. It's this hateful bunch of people, you know, the look to it. Unfamiliar. They were unfamiliar with Joseph. Here's the next passage here. In Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, it says, Now there rose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. We already read that part there in Exodus. If you want to be back in Exodus again, we'll go back that way. It says there rose up a new king that knew not Joseph. Now I showed you illustrated why, and we'll come back to it in a second. I showed you after Joseph had died, the generation died. There's probably about 75 years time span that goes on. That Pharaoh that was with Joseph, he'd already passed away. He's gone. There was other Pharaohs that came along. But at this time here, it says there came a new king that knew not Joseph. Which is interesting. Because in Acts chapter, as you see it, Acts chapter 7, verse 17, if you want to turn there. I should turn there for you. Acts chapter 7. We'll get there. Acts chapter 7. This is when, this is when Stephen is talking, you know, getting right before he gets stoned to death. It's when Stephen is giving us this long dissertation about Israel and the nation of Israel and the history of Israel and all the events that took place and about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, Stephen is stoned after this. But during this, he presents to them and, and to the people that he's before, he says, this verse, look at verse 15. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, and he and, he and our fathers and were carried over uh, into Shechem and laid in the sepulcher. That's what Jacob was. And that Abraham, brought, that Abraham bought for a sum of money of the sons of Imor, the, the father of Shechem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, what was the promise? I know. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, The promise that God gave Abraham over 400 some years earlier, when he said that promise is getting ready to draw nigh. But when the, where's it? But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God has sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Now, interesting about this word another, this is what I want to point out. I'm not smart about this, I had to find this out myself. Let me put my marker here. There are two Greek words for another. Anybody have any ideas what it might be? All you Greek scholars out there? I'll show you the two words. I'm not a Greek scholar. I had to find this out myself. 
There's one called, oh, where are you at? How you want to pronounce it, ALOS. The G, if you're all familiar with that, with G243, y'all understand what that G means? Strong's Concordance is a big, huge book. It's like a dictionary. And the guy identified every word in the, in the scriptures, Old Testament, New Testament. H means it's Hebrew, G means it's Greek. And he identifies it as a Greek word, and he numbered them this way to help us people who don't know Greek understand, okay, this is where it comes from. So this Greek word, using G243 as a number to identify it, means this. It means another of the same kind. But if you turn to John, that, that same another is used in John chapter 14, verse 16, and it says this. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. So what does that mean when you hear that another there? Do you understand what it's talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ said he'll bring another comforter. The comforter is like who? It's like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's God. He's God. Okay? So this other another here that you're going to see, heteros is G2287, means another of a different kind. And you're so familiar with this passage, you should be. Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. What does that mean? It's not... It's, it's a totally different. It's not the gospel. Paul's pointing that out. It's not the gospel. It's totally something. It's foreign. Even though it's got the word gospel attached to it somehow, it's still foreign. It's not the true gospel. It's another. So this word that's used here, which one do you think is being used? The second one is being used in Acts. That one there. Till another king. Now what kind of kings do they have? What were those rulers that were in Egypt? Pharaohs, weren't they not? They were all pharaohs, they're all descendants, da, 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 and works on the way down the list. It's Isaiah chapter 52, verse 4 says, For thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. And I don't know if the Assyrian is talking about this ruler here, or it's talking about a different period. But I think it's interesting to see this, how he talks about how they went down to Egypt and they were persecuted as well. So I'm going to show you here, hopefully, these people here. Now, I may not pronounce it exactly right, but Hyksos. They were a pneumatic people who conquered and ruled ancient Egypt. They were people that came in and took over. Now some say, well, that's when Joseph came in. I don't think so. That's my standing. Because of the Egyptian word for this, like this word comes from, the hyksos, means rulers of foreign lands that come in. Now, Joseph was a ruler, was he not? And he came from a foreign land, but I don't think he was one of them. Now, this is a different group of people. You saw my timeline, and hopefully you might have seen that or not. Back to the timeline. Here's when the new king came around. The hyksos uh, rulers came in. And took over. And when they came in, I believe they're the ones who took over. And they're the ones who put them into slavery at that time. Because if you go back to Exodus chapter 1 again. Let's go back down to verse 8. And there arose up a new king over Egypt, in which knew not Joseph. Now stop here for a second. Just think. Joseph died about here. And there was a pharaoh here. There was another pharaoh in here somewhere, somebody else. So there was other pharaohs between this time period. You know, so there's 60-some years taking place in there, between here and there, before these people came in. Do you think there was other pharaohs in between? Yeah, there's other pharaohs in there. Now, they might have known Joseph, might have known something about him. I don't know, but there's little kids. I don't know. But here you got a group of people that come, and I believe these are the people that came in and put them into slavery here. And it says... Because if you notice what he says here, and he said unto his people, this new king says unto his people, Behold, the people, the children of Israel, are more and mightier than we. And it says, Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, and it come to pass it, that when they falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them out, out of the land. This is my mindset, this is the way I look at this. These people came in and ruled for 
100, approximately 146 years up there. And while they're ruling, they said these, these, these Hebrews are in here, and they may get stronger and mightier than, our, than us and our enemies. Their enemies were also the Egyptians. That they were foreign people who came in to rule the Egyptians. They're ruling these Egyptians. They're afraid that these Hebrews may rise up against them as well. That's my mindset. You may say, John, you're totally wrong off the base, but whatever. That's where I'm going with this whole thing. This is where the new king is. Because if you go back to Acts, like I just showed you, it was another person. Another type of person that came in. So they go into slavery. Now, let me ask you this. Did this catch them off guard, you think? There's over... So many years, Joseph, you know, remember when, when Abraham got the, the promise? Okay, that was many, many years before this. And then Joseph comes in land, and Jacob comes into the land, and they're there. They're descendants of the same. And when Moses writes Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, and Deuteronomy, he writes these things. He writes of the promise that was given to Abraham when Moses writes these things. I'm just thinking out loud. Get y'all, let's get the wheels rolling a little bit. But you think they might have remembered this promise that God had given to Abraham? And what was his promise to Abraham? That they would be in the land. They would serve, be servants. They'd be in that land, in a strange land. But after 400 years, they would be what? They'd be leaving. But I don't think it ever, it never seemed to occur to them. I don't think so. I don't know. But there's no indication they ever thought about that. That they were going to be leaving this land like this. <laughs> Next point, unfamiliar with Jehovah. Unfamiliar with Jehovah. The passage in, uh, now this kind of jumps a little bit in Exodus because it jumps to chapter 5 in Exodus. But it just kind of gives you the idea about these Pharaohs, what their mindset is. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Did it show up? No, it didn't show up. Religion in ancient Egypt was characterized by a complex polytheism as wide and variety of local deities and nature gods were worshipped by the people. Many gods were associated with fertility and agriculture and the protection of virtually every aspect of life as ascribed to some deity. And over here's a table kind of shows you some of their deities that they used their, for their ancient gods. And I have here a table. I didn't want to... But some of these gods, just for instance, you're probably familiar with them when you hear some of these names. Um, see if he's up there. I can't see if it's too well enough. Like Horus, H-O-R-U-S, sky god. He's represented like a falcon. They have another one, Isis, goddess of, of life, a healing, daughter of Gib, whatever, mother of Horus. All these different gods that they had. They had Cones, the moon god, Matt. Justice, mute, eye of the sun, all these multiple here gods that they have. Can you imagine that? That's a complex polytheism that they had going on here. These Egyptians, these people here. Who was living among these Egyptians? The Israelites were. Would they not be exposed to this idolatry as well? They would be exposed to this. They're living among these people. But they were also, I think they had their eyes still on, we're, we're children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We're children of them. We're children of God. We're different. And they lived differently. And they were recognized differently in the land. Because while they're in the land, because even in, uh, he points out in verse, uh, where's it at, doesn't it? In verse 13, and the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. They, they understood that these were a different type of people. They were separate. They weren't part of us. Even though they lived in this land for over 400 years, they were not part of us in this land. Isaiah 52, 4 says, Thus saith the Lord God, My people went down aforetime to Egypt to sojourn there. Oh, I already read that verse to you. I forgot. I read that verse. Unfair with people. They were unfair with people. And this is what I just touched on for you. Verse 13, verse 14 down there. 
And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and, and brick and all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve what was, was with rigor. So why did they do that to them? I know I've missed over several passages here. Verse 10. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. We already read that verse. Verse 11. Therefore, they did set over them taskmaster to afflict them with their burdens, and they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. And But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And, and they were greed because the children of Israel. No matter how hard... The Egyptians were making it for the Israelites. They were still growing. They were still multiplying. They were still surviving. It wasn't making them diminish and getting any smaller at that. And they tried to lay a harder burden on them, did they not? With rigor here. Here's a, a brick from one of the... Uh, mud brick from the, in the front of the British Museum there. So Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 20 says, But the Lord hath taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace, even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as ye are this day. I mean, I can't imagine people being under such servitude. And I know we've dealt with that in the United States as well, I understand. But here, the Egyptians putting these people into slavery and mistreating them and trying to do everything they can against them. Of course, we're going to read about where they try to kill them as well. But all of this, but God says what? He brought them out of that. Don't you see it? It would seem kind of hopeless, wouldn't it? It seemed kind of hopeless to the Israelites because you'll see later on too when they cry to the Lord and the Lord heard their voice when they cried to him. What they were dealing with. In Isaiah chapter 48 verse 10 it says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver, but I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. A, key, a passage that we're so familiar with, James chapter 1 verses 2 through 3 says, My brethren... Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying your faith worketh patience. We, we can run into situations, can we not, in our lives and be afflicted different ways. We're not in servitude. We're not slaves. Hopefully that never happens, but we're not slaves. But whatever happens in our lives, we're still... Paul, you know, James writes here, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations, knowing this, that the trying your faith worketh patience. How do we respond when we're tried in our lives? Here's my closing thoughts for this, this part of this lesson here for you to think about. The Hebrews were invited into Egypt. And they were what? They were given the best of the land. I pointed that out to you earlier. You think moving into this new, new property, new real estate, hey, we got this going to be a great life here for us, you know, your families and all that. Um, excuse me. Getting hot. You, know, you think this is a great life. We can, we can settle right here. It'd be great for us to live, raise our kids, and, you know, families just keep growing, you know. And they had the best of the land. But it was only a temporary place for them through all of this. They lived in peace after the death of Joseph for approximately 75 years. I pointed that out to you. Approximately 75 years, they still lived in peace until they went into, until the new king came into power. They were recognized as a group of people separate from the Egyptians, even after being in Egypt for all those years. And I think that's kind of significant. Even after being in an idolatrous people, and they're, I mean, can you imagine? Day in and day out. It's not like, well, okay, they believe that, but day in and day out, you're, you're bombarded with this, and their mindset of these Egyptians and their thoughts of their religion. But they're still seen, the, the Israelites are still seen as a separate people. They maintain that separateness from them. Should not we as Christians maintain that separateness in our lives, our testimonies, to do what? Around us, we live, we got all kinds of things going around us. I mean, all kinds, of, we're inundated all the time with things on TV and the news and whatever else and people around us. But how do we live as a testimony? Should we not shine as a testimony? 
as a witness to the Lord, to these people. Be a shining light. They were put into slavery and served with rigor, but the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied and grew. This didn't stop them. My last point is, the Lord always keeps his promises. If you want to turn there, Acts chapter 7, it says, and that's what we already talked about, Acts chapter 7, verse 17. Remember that? And when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. In Acts chapter 13, verses 22 through 33, it says, And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it, as it is written in the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. In 2 Peter chapter two, uh, chapter 3, I'm going to turn there, 2 Peter chapter 3, and we'll be closing up here in a moment. 2 Peter... Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Knowing this, knowing this first, that this shall come in the last days, scoffers making, walking after their own lust, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of what by... of that by the word of God the heavens were of old and earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that they then was being overflowed with water perish. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved into fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. People say, well, Christ is coming back. Y'all say Jesus is coming back. I mean, this, this world's been like this for ages. We just, we just deal with all kinds of stuff. But what? We look for Jesus to come back again. And people may scoff at us that you're crazy. You're a bunch of loonies, you know. But we're looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. I, didn't, I thought I had up there, but I didn't. Titus chapter 1, verse 2 says, In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. God cannot lie. He promised Abraham all those years ahead. He said, this is what's going to happen to your people, your descendants. And did it not happen? Yes, it did happen, exactly like he said it would. Anybody have any comments, any questions? Yes? Oh, that Joseph, when Joseph died, they were taking his body out. Yeah. Right, right. That's a good point. He looked at four. He knew they were going to leave someday when they left. Yeah, good point. Anybody else? All right. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. We'll pick up next week on this chapter one on the next part of this. And uh, hopefully we'll learn something that will help us. Heavenly Father, dear Lord, thank you for taking care of us. Thank you for your word. And just thank you, Lord, that you allow us to have your word in our hands and to be able to read it and to study it and, and to learn from it, Lord, to learn of your grace, your mercy, how you took care of your people, even through the tough times, how you took care of them through all of this and how you blessed them. And Lord, help us in our lives, Lord, how to live for you through all that we're dealing with now and, this, and people having to deal with this COVID, this virus and and those who have been touched with it, Lord, how it's impacting families. We ask that you'd help uh, take care of our families, protect them, Lord, each one, if you would, please. And help our pastor, Lord, as he preaches, he teaches, and he leads us, and the wisdom he needs all the time. Just take care of him, hug him beside you all the time. And help us to do all we can to be a blessing and encouragement one to another, to help with each other and to be a blessing. Just guide and direct. And if somebody's lost today, they realize how lost they are, and they need to get saved and trust your promises. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.